many people are asking for children to come back to the faith, and many were praying for uh, against the bill that is uh, before the Queensland Parliament, praying for uh, life to be respected from uh, conception right through until natural death. They were the most number of letters have that petition in it. But with so many letters of petition, there are not a great number of letters of thanksgiving. So tomorrow night we expect a huge number of letters of thanksgiving. So just a few of the ones that did come in. Thank you God, you gave me peace. I know now that my brother rests in peace. Lord, you love us and you have transformed my life. Dear Mother, I am so grateful um, to have been given this opportunity to attend this mission, receiving the healing and the reconciliation and the gift of the Holy Spirit has made me very peaceful and prayerful. Thank you, Mother, for the blessing and the gifts that I have received. I will share and reach out to others that also need help. Thank you. Dear Mother of Perpetual Help, thank you for helping me and my son of all these years. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. And actually there are some also written in other languages, which I don't know. So, um, now just a few um, notices. The most important one is uh, we are going to um, have the 40 hours of adoration beginning tomorrow. We did that last time. I had a, a mission here in the uh, Holy Spirit. We had 40 hours at the end of the mission. We're going to do that again. Uh, that is a um, a custom that grew up in the church in the Middle Ages and was very common in Australia until the 1960s. I remember the, the small country town where I grew up, Warwick Neville in Victoria, had 40 hours every year. And so many parishes used to have it, but it's something that's uh, not as common today. Although, on the other hand, perpetual Eucharistic adoration is spreading today. So there are some uh, little pledge cards down at the back, Margaret has them, and it says, yes, I'm willing to participate in the 40 hours of adoration starting Friday night, and it will start at 6 p.m. tomorrow night, so we get 40 hours in before, by the end of the 9 o'clock mass on Sunday. And it says, yes, I'm, and also, we can say, yes, I am willing to spend at least an hour with Jesus uh, on a more regular basis. And if you would um, uh, put your name and phone number and email if you have it. So these little um, slips have been prepared for you to join in the adoration. Of course, many of you already do the adoration on the first Friday. Tomorrow is the first Friday. But there are some other hours to be filled in right through Saturday and through Saturday night. I'll be, made the theme tomorrow is adoration. I'll be speaking about adoration tomorrow night. In the morning, I'll be talking about life after death. Very important for us to consider what happens when we die, because our life on this earth is very brief if we compare with eternal life. So we'll reflect on death and eternal life tomorrow, what's waiting for us uh, when we die. Um, I'll be available for reconciliation for the need that haven't yet been able to receive it. Uh, I'll be available afterwards tonight and tomorrow morning after the Mass too. Um, there are still a few of the items for sale. Most of them have gone now, but there is still cynical groceries and visits books and St. Alphonsus. So if you'd like to buy them, they're down the van. We don't have a collection except once during the mission and that will be tomorrow night. So to cover the expenses of the mission, we ask you to bring along your wallets tomorrow night. There'll be a collection uh, during the mission for the last night. So now if you please stand and we'll have our Marian here.
I begin with this story from the Korean War. During the Korean War, there was a young man in Korea. He discovered that he was adopted. And he was um, very angry because he discovered it in teenage years. And he was angry thinking his natural parents had not wanted him, and adopted him out. And so he, 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 his behavior became extremely bad. He got into drugs, he got into bad company, he was troublesome at school. But one day after a very bad incident, the mother who adopted him pulled out a shoebox and told him the story of his life. In this shoebox was a dress stained with blood. During the Korean War, in the bitter cold of winter, this mother tried to get away from the bombs and the fighting, carrying her baby in her arms. She walked and walked and walked, until exhausted she could go no further. And to warm her child, she took off the dress and wrapped him tightly in it, embracing him. She froze to death. But a little later someone came by, saw her body almost naked, and the bundle tightly held, heard the cry of a child, and found a boy. She had given her life to save his. When the young man heard this, of course, he was deeply moved. He asked to be taken to the spot where his mother had died. He wept bitterly and he asked forgiveness and changed his way of life. But just as that mother gave her life for her son, each of us has been saved at the cost of a life. It's the life of Jesus on the cross. And so whenever Mass is celebrated, we commemorate and we make present that heroic act of love of Jesus. So today I want you to speak about the Mass. In Australia today, the latest um, statistics really show that, um, well, in 1954, 75% of Australian Catholics attended Mass every Sunday. That's probably a surprise to some of you who are new migrants and see the Church today. Yes, we were a strong Christian nation in the 1950s. In 2014, it was 11%. I would imagine now it's below 10%. In other words, on any Sunday, 90% of Catholics are no longer coming to Mass. Why? Well, there's so many choices. There's sport, television, social media. With regard to young people, there's a lot of peer pressure. They can be made fun of if they still go to church. There's the lack of faith. Some of them will say, oh, mass, mass is boring. Sometimes people uh, stop going to Mass because they fall out with a priest. Then there are the scandals in the church, and people walk away from the church. Maybe it's poor sermons, or they can't understand the priest, or it's the church choir, not, of course, the one here. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, all these reasons are given by people why they don't go to Mass. I, in the days when I was a little bit healthier and uh, younger, I did a great deal of visiting door to door, and you would meet these Lapsed Catholics, and they give some of these reasons. I think the most common one was usually a falling out with a priest. They had a row with some priest, and they took it out on Jesus. Yeah. Well, now, people who understand the Mass, it's very different. And uh, I've got a picture there of a man whom I got to know in Perth. I was giving a mission in the church, which is pictured there. In, uh, yeah. 
And uh, that man was severely disabled. He had, his body was racked with pain. Just to walk a short distance was an excruciating effort for him. And the parish priest had offered to bring him Holy Communion regularly at home. But no, I walked to his house and it took me seven minutes. It would take him about 45 minutes. He would struggle so much. And yet he insisted every day he would be coming to the Mass. He would say, well look, look what it cost Jesus. Jesus had to carry that cross. Jesus had to be crucified for me. And that is what is made present in the Mass. So I will not miss it for anything. The next one there, I was from a mission that I gave up in North Queensland, around, well, what's your Queensland? Just so you know some of these places, like Chilico and Dimbula. There was a mission in Dimbula, in Red Dome. Uh, this um, man, his name was David Statham, he was working in the mines in Chilico, and his work was overnight. So on Sunday morning, he'd drive two hours to in Buddha for mass. Then he'd have breakfast there, he'd go home, have a short sleep, and then back to work. That was because the mass was so important to him. He would travel, and I just came back from uh, Loganville in Papua New Guinea. I was there only a couple of weeks ago. I was there for three weeks preaching. The last mass that I said there, in Hantua, the town of Hantua, in central Bougainville. Bougainville is a place that you can hardly imagine. I couldn't have imagined a place like this existed still in the 21st century. It had 10 years of civil war, and it's absolutely been devastated. There is no transportation. The bishop gave me his four-wheel drive, so I had a vehicle. I went to Mass. There were a thousand people at Mass in Hantua. I was the only one who came in, the only one vehicle there. The other people we picked up some of them on the way. But we would see all these people streaming to Mass in their Sunday best. People who appreciate, people walking two hours, one hour. I even met a family in another parish that walks three and a half hours each way to Mass. So what a difference. What we see here, unfortunately, so many people in Australia living just around the corner, but they don't come to Mass. Right through the history of the Church, there have been those who really appreciated the Mass. For example, the early Christians, the persecution. I wonder, did any of you see that um, film, the recent film that was shown in many theatres in Sydney anyway, Call of Us with Christ? Did you see that film? Some of you did, yeah. It was, a, it was a film, the first time I saw it, I didn't quite understand it. I went to see it the second time, and I did understand it. It wasn't really about Paul, it was about the early Christians under Nero, and uh, the terrible suffering that they endured. And the early Christians, in the midst of all this suffering, they would go down into the catacombs. The Romans <laughs> were superstitious, so they wouldn't follow them down into the place where the dead were buried. So they were safe there, and they would have mass, but they were risking their lives. And of course, many of them were martyred, taken out to the lines, even in Nero's time, set alight in the streets. So these people did this, risk their lives for mass. In Elizabeth I, Elizabeth I was very different from Elizabeth II. She was a very brutal and cruel woman, and under her, Catholics were persecuted. Catholics were hung, drawn in water. And anybody who would shelter a priest was cruelly put to death. And priests, of course, were hunted down, and then they were hung, drawn in water. But they continued to see it. If they could have all these priest holes, the Catholics continued to have mass because they appreciated it so much. In the communist chairs, priests risked their lives to get 
uh, and Catholics risked their lives to provide them with a little bit of wine and bread that they could celebrate Mass. One of those who did was Cardinal Van Quinn in uh, Vietnam. He was able, almost miraculously, to be able to obtain tiny bits of uh, altar wine and host and to be able to celebrate Mass in one who was in solitary confinement for several years. These people truly appreciated the Mass. We only have to look back. This year we celebrated 100 years. There was a big Mass in Sydney to commemorate 100 years since the Blessed Sacrament was preserved in a home in Sydney. When Australia began, Catholics were persecuted. They weren't allowed to have priests. In the early years, no priests were allowed. A priest did come to Sydney. I think he was a French priest. He celebrated Mass and he left the Blessed Sacrament in a private home. And the Catholics would gather there in that private home and uh, pray the rosary and pray uh, together. And we celebrated 100 years of that today. So, a uh, tremendous faith that people have had for the Eucharist and for the Mass in history. Now there's some of the... I think I put some pictures there. For, no, that's the priest holes in one of the buildings of the, the richer people in England who are Catholics sometimes have these secret hiding places for priests. Uh, that's a picture of one which has been discovered in the house recently. And there's a monk being hung, drawn and quartered. That's what used to happen to them under Elizabeth I. Now, I'm going to concentrate in this talk on a beautiful letter written by Pope John Paul II. It was the last encyclical that he wrote, and it was uh, called Ecclesia de Eucharistia, that means the Eucharist in relationship to the Church. And he said that the reason that he wrote this encyclical it wasn't to teach some new things about the Mass. The Church had already taught us many things about the Mass, and he has repeated the teachings of the Church in this. But he said the purpose of this encyclical is to rekindle a sense of profound amazement and gratitude. This amazement should always fill the Church assembled for the celebration of the Eucharist. Today we have a little meeting. And one of the men, I can't remember his name now, but he was talking about a priest. I think, was it Mike Amos? He was talking about the priest who was the chaplain to the Casilia, Father Peter, somebody or other. He said that at every Mass, he still feels like it's his first Mass. He's still filled with wonder. It's, a, it's an inspiration for me. I can't admit to the same thing, but I have to work at it. But Pope John Paul said, this amazement, this gratitude should always fill the Church, assemble for the celebration of the Eucharist. Pope uh, John Paul, in this, he stresses the context in which Jesus gave us the Eucharist. He says, uh, it was the hour of his passion, death and resurrection. Every priest who celebrates Holy Mass is led back in spirit to that place and to that hour. There's a beautiful passage he has there in that letter. Um, that... The institution of the Eucharist sacramentally anticipated the events which were about to take place. Remember, it's before the night before he was to suffer and die. Beginning with the agony in Gethsemane, once again we see Jesus as he leaves the upper room, descends with his disciples to the Kidron Valley and goes to the Garden of Olives. Even today that garden shelters some very ancient olive trees. Maybe some of you have been there. Perhaps they witnessed what happened beneath their shade that evening 
When Christ in prayer was filled with anguish and his sweat became like drops of blood falling down upon the ground, the blood which shortly before he had given to the church as the drink of salvation in the sacrament of the Eucharist began to be shed. Its outpouring would be completed on Golgotha to become the means of our redemption. Christ as High Priest entered once for all into the Holy Place, taking not the blood of goats and calves, but His own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. But John Paul goes on to talk about the many different experiences he had of celebrating Mass, all precious memories when he was first ordained, when he became a, a, a bishop in St. Peter's Basilica, so many basilicas and churches in Rome and throughout the world. I've been able to celebrate Holy Mass in chapels built along mountain paths, on lake shores and sea coasts. I've celebrated it on altars built in stadiums and in city squares. The Eucharist, even when it's celebrated on the humble altar of a country church, is some way celebrated on the altar of the world. And every priest has these. He says the all Eucharist is always celebrated on the altar of the world. It unites heaven and earth. It permeates all creation. It is the most precious possession the church can have in her journey through history. That's why it's such a tragedy that so many people here in our country have walked away from the Eucharist. They don't appreciate what Jesus has done for us, that he has given his life on the cross. This is the most precious possession the church can have in her journey through history. We, when we go to Mass very often, we can lose that sense of amazement. Um, Pope John Paul goes on, whenever the Church celebrates the Eucharist, it can in some way relive the experience of the two disciples on their way to Emmaus. Their eyes were opened and they recognized him. We remember that story from uh, the two true disciples on their way to Emmaus. The same day, the resurrection, they were on their way to a village seven miles from Jerusalem and they were talking together about all that had happened. And it happened that as they were talking together and discussing it, Jesus himself came up and walked by their side. But their eyes were prevented from recognizing him. And he said to them, what are all these things you're discussing as you walk along? And they stopped, their faces downcast. They were sad, they were disappointed, they were disillusioned, their hopes had been dashed. And one of them said, well, you must be the only person staying in Jerusalem who doesn't know the things that have been happening these last few days. And Jesus said, what things? About Jesus of Nazareth, how our chief priests and our leaders had him over to be sentenced to death, had him crucified. Our hope had been that he would be the one to set Israel free. And that's not all. Two whole days have passed, and some women have astounded us. They went to the tomb. When they couldn't find the body, they came back to tell us they'd seen a vision of angels who declared he was alive. And Jesus said to them, you foolish men, so slow to believe all that the prophets have said. Wasn't it necessary that the Christ should suffer before entering his glory? Now starting with Moses and going through all the prophets, he explained to them the passages throughout the scriptures that were about himself. So there we see the first part of the Eucharist, the Liturgy of the Word. And the Liturgy of the Word is very important. Um, Pope Francis, in his letter, in the Joy of the Gospel, has a beautiful passage there. 
directed especially at priests, but we could say that, it, that all of us will profit from listening to this, particularly those who have the privilege of proclaiming the word, of reading the word during Mass. But Francis says, preparation for priest preaching is so important a task that a prolonged time of study, prayer, reflection and pastoral creativity should be devoted to it. With great affection, I wish to stop for a moment and offer a method of preparing homilies. Some may find these suggestions self-evident, but I consider it helpful to offer them as a way of emphasising the need to devote quality time to this precious ministry. Some pastors argue that such preparation is not possible given the vast number of tasks which they must perform. Nonetheless, I presume to ask that each week a sufficient portion of personal and community time be dedicated to this task, even if less time has to be given to other important activities. Trust in the Holy Spirit who is at work during the homily and is not merely passive but active and creative. It demands that we offer ourselves and all our abilities as instruments which God can use. A preacher who doesn't prepare is not spiritual, he is dishonest and irresponsible with the gifts he has received. You know, in other countries, uh, like I remember in the Philippines particularly, but also it's in, down in parts of Indonesia and Singapore, um, people meet together with their priest and share with the about the readings of the coming Sunday. And they they go into them and they share their own life experiences in relation relation to the um, readings. I always found it a great help in preaching because you hear people people's life experiences related to this gospel that's coming up. So the important thing is that um, Jesus, when he explained the word to them. Their hearts burned within them. So when we, uh, we should prepare like that and the people who read the scripture so we can kindle that flame in our own hearts and in the hearts of those who hear us. Then the second part of that story in of the disciples to Emmaus when they drew near to the village to which they were going, Jesus made as if to go on. But they pressed him to stay with them, saying, It's nearly evening and the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. Now while he was with them at table, he took the bread and said the blessing, and then he broke it and handed it to them. So he was celebrating the Eucharist with them. And their eyes were opened and they recognized him. And he vanished from their sight. And then they said to each other, Did in our hearts burn within us as he talked to us on the road and explained the scriptures to us? So now we come to the liturgy of the Eucharist. And St. Paul, in his letter to the Corinthians, in chapter in, um, the first Corinthians, chapter eleven, he gives his account of the institution of the Eucharist. He says, For the tradition I received from the Lord, and also handed on to you, is that on the night he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread, and after he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way with the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Whenever you drink it, you do it as a memorial of me. Whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are proclaiming the death of the Lord until he comes. And uh, Pope uh, John Paul II comments on that passage of St. Paul. He says, the words of the Apostle Paul bring us back to the dramatic setting in which the Eucharist was born. The Eucharist is indelibly marked by the event of the Lord's passion and death, of which not, it's not only a reminder, but a sacramental 
representation. It is the sacrifice of the cross perpetuated down the ages. When the Church celebrates the Eucharist, the memorial of her Lord's death and resurrection, this central event of salvation becomes really present. Jesus offered this sacrifice only after he had left us a means of sharing in it, as if we had been present there. Each member of the faithful can thus take part in it and inexhaustibly gain its fruits. So each Mass has the same infinite value as the passion, death and resurrection of Jesus on the cross. Now I want to get to the deepest part now, and the most profound part of Pope John Paul's teaching about the Eucharist. And this is the part that shows us the very heart and meaning of the Mass. He says the dramatic setting, the sacrifice of the cross, it is the sacrifice of the cross perpetuated down the ages. Nor does it remain confined to the past, since all that Christ is, all that he did and suffered for men participates in the divine eternity and so transcends all times. This central event becomes really present. This is a bit difficult for us to understand because we are such limited creatures. We are bound by time and place. So the things that we did in the past, they're all over and gone. They're not present anymore. The things that we're going to do in the future, well, we don't even know how long we're going to be alive. They're not present yet. We only have the present moment. But God is different. God is not God. Everything is present to God. What is past for us, what is future for us, is all present to God. And Jesus, since he was divine, everything he did, and all his suffering and his death participates in the divine eternity and so transcends all time. That's why Jesus was able to make his death, resurrection, present at the Last Supper. It hadn't yet happened in time, but because he's a divine person. And that's why when we celebrate the Mass, it becomes truly present in that sacramental way. I've got a little, um, just a kind of a poor image, but to give us some little idea, that's uh, where, here in this place, we can only see around us here. Uh, if we went up into a plain, we'd be able to see the whole of Pine Rivers. If we went up into a satellite, we'd be able to see the whole of the Earth. Well, it's God, you see, can see everything. He can see all moments of time, all at once. That's the way He is. So that's something for us to always remember when we come to Mass. That the Mass, and quoting again Pope John Paul, because he's giving us the deep meanings, the sacrifice of Christ and the sacrifice of the Eucharist are one single sacrifice. The Mass makes present the sacrifice of the cross. It doesn't add to that sacrifice, nor does it multiply it. What is repeated is its memorial celebration which makes Christ's one definitive redemptive sacrifice present. We could compare the Mass with, say, you know, on Anzac Day in Gallipoli, sometimes thousands of young people gather in Anzac Cove, and especially last year, which was the centenary year, thousands of young Australians gathered there in the early morning to commemorate what had happened a hundred years before. But they were remembering a past event. They couldn't bring back all those young men that had died there a hundred years earlier. So it's a memory, it's a commemoration of a past event. The Mass is different. It's not just a commemoration of a past event because it is making the passion, death and resurrection present and it's releasing the infinite, the infinite fruits of that. Each member of the faithful can take part in it and inexhaustibly gain its fruit. What is it that limits the power of the Mass? Obviously it's us. When we're not attentive, when we become distracted, when other things are on our minds. So we need to look at the saints who gave us the example.
The one who is a great example of celebrating Mass was Saint Padre Pio. Padre Pio was misunderstood, he was condemned, he was refused permission to celebrate Mass in public or to exercise his ministry in public for ten years. He was considered a fraud. So he used to celebrate Mass privately in the choir loft. I was privileged to be there and to see the place where he celebrated Mass. And while he was celebrating Mass, you know he had the uh, wounds of Jesus, the stigmata. And while he's celebrating Mass, he is feeling the pains of Jesus in his hands, his feet. He's feeling terrible pain and suffering. It would take him hours to celebrate the Mass. During these years when he was forbidden to say public Mass, he would be celebrating these Masses with so much love, so much awareness, so much fervor, that when he was released from these prohibitions, enormous fruits came in his ministry and hundreds of thousands of people came to him to confession. So he is one that we could take as a model for how uh, to attend Mass, to try to remember what the Mass truly is. Another one that I believe was a tremendous model was the Pope Emeritus, Pope Benedict XVI. I had three occasions to witness a Mass of his. The, the first time I was with the pilgrimage group for the closing Mass for the Year of the Family. Pope John Paul II was still the Pope, but that the square of St. Peter's was thronged with families, most of them, many of them Italians, lots of children, lots of young people, plenty of noise and excitement. And about 45 minutes before the Mass began, a solitary cardinal came out, knelt on a preacher before the altar, and was deep in prayer. I was very impressed with Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger later to become the Pope. And I saw him there, completely wrapped in prayer, unaware of all the noise and everything that was going on. And then about 15 minutes before the Mass, he went inside, joined Pope John Paul and messed it. was my first experience. The second time was when the funeral of Pope John Paul II. Actually, during the funeral of Pope John Paul II, I wasn't able to watch it on TV because I was hearing confessions all the time. Uh, particularly of the Italians, because the Italian television in Australia for several days covered the death and the life of Pope John Paul. And these people were so moved they were coming to confession during his funeral. But later on I watched it on the video recorder in those days. And it was celebrated by Cardinal Ratzinger. And again, the thing that I noticed about him was the total attention and reverence right throughout that Mass. Nothing distracted him. And my third experience was World Youth Day in Sydney, 2008. And I was blessed because I was living in Perth in those days and I came across and the Anglicans gave us their uh, college at the University of New South Wales for visiting Greece, which was right next to Roman Grace School. So I was able to get down there very early and get into the third row of the celebrating priest right in front of the chair of Pope Benedict. Now it was very, uh, very noisy and you know a huge crowd of people, the biggest crowd that's ever been assembled in Australia were there for that Mass. And the priests were not always very recollected. Lots of talking and going on around among the priests who were kind of celebrating. Every time I got distracted, I looked at Benedict. He never seemed to be distracted. I know John, John Paul II sometimes used to look around, Francis look around, but this man, so, so concentrated, so recollected, so focused on Jesus. He asked actually that there be a crucifix put in front of the priest at Mass so he can look at Jesus when he is celebrating Mass. And he always focused on that. So that's the models for us. You know, when we go to Mass frequently, we can be distracted. We can get used to it. And so we need to um, focus and think of these people like, Pope Francis and that's like what I was saying for Benedict and, and Saint Padre Pio, who to me were the greatest models of Mass. It's easy for us, for Mass to become routine. We have to stir up our faith and ask the great saintly priest to help us, above all, uh, our great recent Pope.
and will let us look at it in But no one can help us more than the one who stood by the cross and who stands by the priest at the altar. So I'll finish with a little prayer to our blessed lady. Dear Mother of Perpetual Help, help us to really appreciate the Mass. It's so easy for us to be distracted, for our Mass to become something routine. Help us to prepare well for Mass. Help us to remember the love of your Son Jesus, to remember how much it cost him to leave us this precious gift to remember his three hours of agony on the cross. Teach us to understand and appreciate that his sacrifice for us is truly present each time we attend Mass, that each Mass is of infinite value. Never let us neglect Mass or grow cold in our love for him.